What's going on guys? My name is Matt and I am back with a new PC build. This time the price point is $750 and for that price you're getting a powerful gaming PC capable of maxing out games at 1080p and even good enough to stream gameplay to sites like Twitch. Now this video is going to be a full PC build guide. I'm not only going to be talking about the parts and why I picked them, but I'm also going to show you how to put the system together step by step, show you all the software and drivers you need, and finally show you benchmarks for a ton of different games. The price to performance the system is offering is great and it's a very easy PC to build even for first timers. As a teaser for the performance, this PC plays COD Warzone at 1080p with a well over 100 FPS average. I'm happy to say this video is in partnership with Micro Center, who is the one stop shop for all of your work and learn from home tech needs. They offer by far the best in person experience for buying PC parts and while I did go off of pricing from Amazon and Newegg, buying these parts in store at Micro Center would save you a good amount of money through combo deals and other discounts. Right now, you can get a free 32GB flash drive and microSD card for heading in store, and for more information, see the link in the description. Also, they offer a custom PC builder which helps you spec and budget out your system using parts that they have in stock and ready to be purchased. Check the links in the description to find a micro center near you, and to check out not only the PC builder but also their build showcase area where you can see other PC builds and show off your own. So now that you have a base understanding of what the system is, let's go ahead and talk about the parts inside of this $750 gaming beast. Let's start things off with the CPU. For an entry to mid-level gaming PC, the current king of value per dollar computing is the Ryzen 3 3100, which comes in around $110. This is a 4-core, 8-thread CPU based on AMD's Zen 2 architecture. It has a base and turbo speed of 3.6 and 3.9 GHz respectively, but the cool thing is that this is an unlocked chip meaning it's capable of being overclocked for even more performance. Now yes, new Ryzen CPUs were recently announced, but all of them are relatively high-end, and there likely won't be new Ryzen 3 CPUs until mid to late 2021. With all that being said, if you can find a Ryzen 3 3300X, that would be a good option, but the stock on that CPU is basically non-existent. One other great thing about Ryzen CPUs like the 3100 we're using in this system is the fact they come with really nice stock coolers in the box. The version that came with our CPU is the stealth cooler. Now this is basically a hunk of aluminum with a fan attached, but for a lower powered chip like the 3100, this does more than okay and can even handle a mild overclock. Beyond this, I think it looks really nice, especially when compared to something like the Intel stock cooler. Moving on to the motherboard, I went with something that offers some pretty good value for its cost and is a board I'm trying for the first time. This is the Asus Prime B450M-A. This board features four dim slots, decent back panel I.O., and a nice neutral color scheme. Because this is a B450 chipset board, it means a few things. First of all, it allows for overclocking. The VRMs on this board aren't the best, but for a mild overclock on a Ryzen 3, it should work fine. Secondly, B450 boards will be getting support for the upcoming Ryzen 5000 series CPUs in January, meaning when it's time to upgrade, you could pop in a new 6 or 8 core Ryzen 5000 series CPU with no problems. Overall, for around $80, this board offers a lot of features for the price, and it worked out great in this build. Moving on to RAM, this is an area where the cost has dropped a decent amount over the course of the last year or so. What I ended up getting is this 2x8GB kit of G-Skill Ripjaws 5 DDR4 RAM for around $60. This kit runs at 3200MHz CL16, which works well in a budget Ryzen system, and it had no problem running at its rated speeds. 16GB is perfect for gaming, and is even enough for streaming and some light video editing. One nice thing is the fact that even with a 2-stick kit, there's still two open RAM slots on our motherboard, so upgrading to 32GB in the future will be as easy as popping in two more sticks. Moving on to storage, I decided to go with an NVMe SSD for a few different reasons. First of all, they're in the M.2 form factor, which makes them very easy to install, and secondly, they offer a lot more performance for not that much more than a traditional SATA SSD. The one I went with is this 500GB Crucial P2. This is a relatively basic NVMe drive, but it worked great in the system. 500 gigabytes is enough for your OS applications and a number of your most played games. Optionally, for another $50, you can either upgrade this to a 1TB NVMe drive 
or grab a two terabyte mechanical drive for mass storage. Moving on to the graphics card, this is the part where it's gonna take the system from a basic computer to a fully fledged gaming PC. What I went with is the NVIDIA RTX 2060. This is the Asus Dual OC model, which performs very well. The two fans and sizable fin and heat pipe array allows this card to stay relatively cool and quiet. The 2060 is perfect for 1080p high refresh rate gaming and is even good enough for playing most games in 1440p with 60 plus FPS. It has 6 gigabytes of video memory and even has built in RT cores for all of that ray tracing goodness. At a little over $300, the performance this card's providing is great and it doesn't hurt that this card looks really nice also. Powering the system is a Corsair CV550. As the name implies, this is a 550 watt power supply with an efficiency rating of 80 plus bronze. This is a high quality unit that supplies plenty of clean power to the entire system. One thing I really like about it is the fact that it has all black sleeve cables which isn't something you always see on a unit at this price. Speaking of the price, the power supply came in at right around $60 which is a really good deal in my opinion. Finally, let's talk about the case. Normally I won't use a case more than once, but when I used this in the recent $600 build, I knew I had to build in it again. This is the Cooler Master MB311L. For $60, this is probably the best budget case I have ever worked in. It offers two addressable RGB fans, a full mesh front panel, a power supply basement, tempered glass, captive thumb screws, and even more. There's plenty of room for cable management, and building in this case is very easy, even for being in the micro ATX form factor. Overall, for for $750, you're getting a set of parts that are reliable, well balanced, and should work well for years to come. Now that you've heard about all the parts and why I picked them, I'm now going to show you how to put this system together step by step and show you all the drivers and BIOS tweaks you need. There are a number of ways and orders to assemble this system, but I'll go over my preferred method. Before you get building, it's important to make sure you're ready by gathering the right tools and have an open area to work on. The only thing you will really need is a standard Phillips head screwdriver and a smaller Phillips head screwdriver driver for the M.2 screw. I use this driver kit which I'll link down below. I would highly recommend you use a magnetic screwdriver. This will make building the PC a little bit easier and can be helpful in a number of ways. With your workspace ready to go, your schedule clear, and your tools in hand, it's now time to start building your PC. Start by getting out your motherboard box, open it up, and grab out the board itself, the IO shield, and the M.2 screw. Take the motherboard out of the bag and rest it on top of the box it came in. Grab the CPU clamshell and open it up so it's ready to go. Bring your attention to the CPU socket on the motherboard, push down and out on the metal retention arm, then lift it up until it's perpendicular to the board. Pick up your CPU, handling it only by the edges, and line the marked corner on the CPU with the marked corner on the motherboard, and lower it into place. You can also line up the Ryzen text with the socket AM4 text on the motherboard. Once in, you can lower the arm back down, making sure it clips into place. Now go ahead and grab the cooler that came in the CPU box. Flipping it upside down, you can see that it comes with thermal paste pre-applied, so there's no reason to add your own. I've used this cooler before, so I had to apply a pea-sized amount of thermal paste, but again, if you bought your CPU new, you won't need to add your own. Lower it down, lining up the pegs with the standoffs in the back plate. Screw these down in a cross pattern until the cooler is secure. As you can see, my cooler has the AMD logo facing up, and if you want yours like that too, all you have to do is unscrew these four screws, rotate the cooler, then reinstall those four screws again. Next, take the CPU fan cable and bring it to the CPU fan header. Line the notch in the connector and the header up and plug it into place. Now it's time to install our RAM. Open up both tabs on slots 2 and 4 which are the gray ones. Now take your first stick of RAM and line the notch in the stick with the notch in the slot and lower it into place. Once in, press down on each end until the two clips snap shut. Repeat the same process for the second stick of RAM in slot 4. The next thing to do is install our SSD. Bring your attention to the M.2 slot located below the CPU socket on the motherboard. Start by installing the M.2 standoff in this hole here. Get out your SSD and line the notch in the drive with the notch in the header. Insert it at an angle, then hinge it down so the notch in the drive lines up with the M.2 peg, and use the small M.2 screw to secure the drive. Once this is done, you can set the motherboard to the side and get out your case box. When removing the case from the box, one tip is to lift the box away from the case instead of trying to lift the case out of the box. This makes things a bit easier. Once your case is out of the box, start by unscrewing the bottom and top thumb screws on the back panel. Once this is done, pull back on the panel and lift it away. Next, grab out the 
accessories bag from the drive cage. This contains all of the screws needed to assemble the system. Next, set the case on its side and unscrew the four thumb screws holding the glass panel in place. Once this is done, lift the panel away. Grab the IO shield that was taken from the motherboard box earlier and with it oriented like this, lower it to the IO cutout and press each corner into place until it's secure. Next, remove the two middle PCIe covers by bending them back and forth until they snap off. I had removed the top one for a previous build, but yours will still be there. Now with that done, grab your motherboard, handling it by the cooler, and lower it into the case, lining the I.O. with the I.O. shield, and making sure you can see the standoffs through the motherboard holes. Next, grab out six motherboard screws that look like this. Take these and install one in each of the motherboard holes that has a standoff beneath it. Now you can lift the case back onto its feet and get out your power supply. With the fan facing down, insert the power supply like this and push it to the back of the case. Use the four screws that came with it to secure it into place. With that done, we can now start routing cables. Start by taking the large 24 pin cable that looks like this and push it through this hole here. Next take the fan splitter and push it through this hole here. Next take the 8 pin CPU power cable and push it through this hole here. Next take the dual 8 pin PCIe power cable and push it through this hole here. Take the USB 3 cable and push it through that same hole and then do the same for the small front panel connectors. Finally take the HD audio cable and push it through here. Because the motherboard we're using doesn't have a digital RGB header, it means we have to use the RGB controller and included with the case. Take this and plug a SATA connector into the end like this. Now take the 3 pin RGB connector from the fans and plug it into the other end of the controller. This controller has a number of different modes but because it's inside of the case it means you have to open up the side panel to change the modes. For someone like me who just sets a profile and never touches it again this works fine but for some of you this may be a deal breaker. Now set the case onto its side so we can begin plugging things in. Start at the top left by taking the 8 pin CPU cable and line the notch in the connector with the notch in the header and press it into place. To the right of this, grab the fan splitter end and plug it into the fan connector next to the CPU fan cable. This plugs in the same way the CPU fan connector did. Now moving to the right side of the board, grab your 24 pin connector and just like the 8 pin, line the notch in the connector and the header and press it into place. Now we're going to plug in the connectors at the bottom of the board starting from the bottom left. Start by locating the audio header and insert the HD audio connector with the text facing up. Now at the bottom right of the board we're going to plug in all of those little front panel connectors. Start by taking the one that says power switch and plug it into these two pins here and orientation doesn't matter for this connector. Directly to the left of that plug in the power LED connectors with the power plus to the left and the negative closest to the power switch. Now take the HDD LED connector and plug it in directly below the power LED cable in the same orientation. Finally, to the right of that, plug in the reset switch like this. Also, you may find plugging in the reset switch and hard drive LED first easier, so do whatever's easiest for you. you can now get out your graphics card because it's time to install it. First open up the PCIe lock like this. Now take your card lining the notch in the card connector with the notch in the slot. Lower it down and once you're sure it's lined up correctly you can press it down until it secures into place and the PCIe lock snaps shut. Next take one or two of the same screws used for the motherboard and screw these into the PCIe bracket to secure the card into place. Now take one of the 8 pin PCIe connectors and line the notch in the connector with the notch in the slot and press it into place. With that done, put the case back onto its feet and bring your attention to the back. You can now do a little cable management by pulling all the excess cable link to the back of the case and making sure all the cables are flat. I would recommend now turning on the PC and looking through the lighting profiles to pick one that you like. Once done, power the system back on and reinstall both of the panels, but before screwing the glass panel on, make sure to do the always satisfying plastic peel. With that done, the system is built, but there are still a number of things we need to do before you can start gaming. The first thing is you need to install Windows. I'm not going to go into how to do that in this video, but it's relatively simple and straightforward. I'll have a link to a video tutorial on how to do this in the description below. Next thing you need to do is with the system shut off, hit the power button then immediately press the delete key repeatedly until you enter into the BIOS. Once into the BIOS, go over to AI Tweaker and change the AI Overclock Tuner from Auto to DOCP. Now save changes and exit. Once this is done, the last thing you need to do is install some drivers. You will need to install motherboard drivers and GPU drivers. All you have to do is download these, extract them, and install them. I'll have links to all the necessary drivers and instructions in the description, so make sure to look there. With this done, you're ready to start playing some games. Hopefully that guide was helpful to some of you who are wanting to build this system. 
It's now time to go over gaming and streaming benchmarks. I tested a bunch of games including Fortnite, Apex Legends, CSGO, Rainbow Six, Shadow the Tomb Raider, and COD Warzone. Let's start things off with Apex Legends at 1080p with most everything set to max. At these settings, the system produced frame rates in the 130s when running around with dips into the low 100s when in combat. This was a very smooth and enjoyable experience. Moving on to Rainbow Six, I test this game using the built-in benchmark at 1080p very high settings. With this system at these settings, I saw a 301 FPS average, which is pretty impressive in my opinion. Next up is Shadow the Tomb Raider, which I tested using the built-in benchmark at 1080p high settings. Doing this resulted in a 98 FPS average, which is great for a title this demanding. In CSGO at 1080p pro settings, the frame rate stayed in the mid to upper 200s most of the time, and overall it was very smooth. In Fortnite at 1080p pro settings, the system stayed in the low 200s most of the time, which should be more than enough performance for even competitive players. Finally, in COD Warzone, I tested at 1080p high settings. We'll doing this, the FPS stayed just above 100 the majority of the time with slight dips here and there. I also used COD Warzone to test the streaming capabilities of this machine. I tested at 1080p 60fps to Twitch using the NVIDIA NVENC encoder. Doing this resulted in both a smooth stream and smooth gameplay on my end. As you can see, the performance on this machine is pretty darn good. Overall, for $750, the system packs a lot of gaming performance and I can highly recommend it for your next PC build. So yeah guys, I think this wraps this video up. Thanks again to Micro Center for partnering up with me for this video. If you guys liked the video, give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing. And as always, this is Matt from Tech by Matt, signing out.